Well, praise the Lord, everybody. This is a Wednesday um, evening uh, prayer and Bible study. We're blessed to have you all here present with us today. And we pray that you all are safe and that you are healthy and that you're at home, that you're pray praying and that uh, your house is covered in, by the blood of Jesus Christ. Let me thank you and um, all of the women uh, ministry and all of those who volunteer to be a blessing to our mothers this past Sunday on Mother's Day. Thank you to all of you who um, went to our mother's homes on Saturday and blessed them with a token of gift of appreciation. Um, just show God's love to them and had prayer with them. I've heard from a number of them who said that they were blessed by it, men with tears in the eyes and saying how much they miss being in the fellowship of the Church of God there at Community Missionary Baptist Church. So let me thank you once again and to all the mothers. We pray that you had a, a blessed and um, a very um, relaxed and a fruitful uh, Mother's Day. You are worthy and deserving of all the gifts and accolades. Uh, we can't give you enough. Uh, Mother's Day is um, one of the greatest days of the year. And I thank God for my mother. I thank God for all my spiritual mothers and uh, the mother of the church, Sister Moore, and all of my, my mothers. We thank God for all of you. We love you with the love of the Lord. And so we welcome you into our Bible study uh, this evening. We're going to be dealing with practicing justice, practice justice, practice um, being fair, practice um, being honest and truthful and treating others as you would like to treat them to treat you. Do unto others as, as you would have others do unto you. Amen. So remember the golden rule. And especially as we look in this lesson, particularly in the uh, mindset of leaders and those that are leading, it's important that we lead with justice, with equality and equity. We want to treat everybody the same. And then we want to defend those who are poor, who cannot defend themselves, those that are helpless. We want to make sure that nobody takes advantage of them. And uh, so we are excited about this lesson today. Before I begin, once again, we welcome all of you that are joining us. We thank God for your presence, your continued presence, support of the ministry. The word of God is still going forward and that God is still blessing. God is still in our midst. God is still doing great and mighty things. And God is still working miracles in this time of purging, in this time of a crisis and turbulent time. God is still in control and he is getting some stuff out of us that we would normally would be doing if uh, we were just comfortable in our um, a familiar setting. But now God is calling us to pray more earnestly. We have to go back and have church and minister the way we did in the old times. Back when, uh, before there was a building, was a place of worship, a church. Uh, the Bible said in the book of Acts that they went from house to house. Breaking the word of God, amen, and prayer. And so that's what we got to do now. Go to house to house and thank God for the vehicle and, and the uh, medium we have uh, with um, uh, Facebook and other uh, devices where we can still reach the home. Uh, but it does not stop us from going to somebody's house and dropping them off a care package and sharing with them the love of God. Amen. So thank you all for your continued ministry. Don't let nothing stop you from ministering. Don't let nothing stop you. That's where you're going to be blessed. That's where you're going to break out of the rut. And if you get some pandemic, um, I feel like you're enclosed in your home, then start reaching out and start ministering and start touching somebody and blessing somebody. Amen. As we pray, before we get into our lesson, let us remember the Mays family. Sister Joseph Mays, one a great woman, a great saint, a great soldier, a great soul who went on to be with the Lord. Let's remember her children, Sister Lisa, her grandchildren, uh, Brother Anthony. Let's pray for all of them, um, her daughters, uh, her sister, amen, her sisters and brothers, amen. Let us remember our brother, Brother Kenny, uh, and, and all the others we do the bound to pray for us. Sister Evelyn Smith, we're praying God's blessing upon you as well. Amen. So thank you for joining us today and let us just have a brief word of prayer. Gracious God and our Father, the Lord of our, the God of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, Master Lord, how we bless you, God, and thank you for who you are. God, we bless you and thank you, God, for what you have done, God, and what you are doing. 
God, even in these difficult and challenging and turbulent times, thou art still yet God. You're a miracle working God. God, we know what you've done in time past. And we know, God, that you're the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. And so, God, we stand on that solid foundation of your word, uh, your promises, and we thank you for the power of the Holy Spirit, God, the dunamis of God that is yet, God, uh, working in us, God, that's being revealed through us. God, we thank you that even right now, God, you are bringing some stuff out of us, God, that, uh, first of all, that don't need to be there. And then secondly, God, you're bringing out our potential, God. You're showing us, God, that we can still minister and reach people and do great and mighty things. So we thank you for covering us with your Holy Spirit. Now, Lord, we pray for the homes of the people of God, the saints of God, that your glory uh, be revealed in them, that you will guard them, that you will guide them, and that uh, you will govern their hearts and minds through this turbulent time. So, God, we thank you right now. We ask your blessing, Lord, upon all the bereaved families, um, the Maid family, the Barton family, the Smith family, God, and all the others we're due to bound to pray for. We pray for our first responders. God, continually have your hand upon them, their families, God, protect them as they continue to serve those essential workers, God, that you will cover them and that, Lord, uh, you will bless them as only you're able to do. Now, Lord, we need you tonight as we... Uh, Study your word in the book of Jeremiah. Give us wisdom, give us knowledge, and all of our getting, give us an understanding. Thank you right now. Touch our eyes, we may see, our ears, we may hear, our heart, that we may be open to receive what thus saith the Lord. We love you, God, for simply for being God. Thank you right now for what you're doing. We yet praise you, we yet magnify you, and we give your name the glory and the praise. For all those that are in our listening ears right now, God, we thank you for them. Bless their homes, their families, and, and God cover them as only you're able to do. We praise you and we bless you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you once again. We welcome all of you here uh, with us today. We're in the book of Jeremiah, the 21st chapter, verses 8 through 14. The subject of our lesson today is practice justice. And it's very important that the people of God that your children of God and all that we do, that we be just in our dealing. Amen. Whether you're an employer, employee, amen, you got to be just in your dealing. Amen. And this is a very critical lesson for the people of God in such a turbulent and trying times we're living in. When you understand the time that Jeremiah was ministering in, amen, it was a time, a culture of apostasy. A falling away. It's a time of political and social and uh, economic and moral chaos, injustice and lawlessness, uh, violence and oppression uh, flooded uh, the society in Jeremiah day. Amen. Jeremiah, his name means Yahweh lifts up or Yahweh throws or heralds. Amen. By the time Jeremiah began his prophetic ministry, Israel had already fallen, the northern kingdom had fallen to the Assyrians. And Judah, the southern kingdom, was struggling to survive. They've already seen what happened to the northern kingdom, and uh, yet uh, uh, they were struggling uh, to survive. Only God could deliver Judah from the hands of his enemies. And how many know the day that only God can deliver us from the hand of our enemy? Amen. Only God can deliver us, amen, from a lot of the calamities and pandemic things that are going on right now. We call on God. We, we, we look for the government to do what they need to do and, and the political people. But ultimately, God is in control of this situation. There's nothing too hard for our God. Our God is an awesome God. He's a mighty God. And so only God could deliver Israel from their enemy. God used the prophet Jeremiah, who's known as the weeping prophet. Amen. He wept over the condition of God's people because God's people refused to heed the warnings of God. God's people refused to heed uh, the word of God, and instead, they just increased in their immorality and social injustice and lawlessness and all the chaos uh, that were going on. 
but there was a prophet, a man of God, that was heeding them and calling them to repent. And uh, they rejected Jeremiah. Matter of fact, they thought that Jeremiah was treasonous and he was a nuisance because in that, in that, in that culture and climate, they uh, heeded to false prophets that preach a false gospel. Amen. They preach peace when really a storm was going to come. And oftentimes, my brothers and sisters, in the midst of a, a culture and climate of chaos and lawlessness, lawlessness and immorality and injustice, in the midst of social injustice and things that are going on, we don't want to heed the word of God. We want somebody to tell us that everything is all right when really God is calling for his people to turn their heart back to him and seek him because only he can deliver them from their enemies. And I believe that God is calling the people of God, even today, in the midst of everything that is going on, to turn our heart back to him, to seek him, because only he, amen, can deliver us from all this stuff that is going on. Amen. We need to turn back to him. Amen. And so tonight, amen, we're dealing with practice justice. I'm going to deal with three things, amen, from this uh, 21st chapter, verses 8 through 14. Amen. I'm going to deal with, first of all, the paradox of the malpractice of justice. The paradox of the malpractice of justice. That's in verses 8, 9, and 10. And then I'm going to deal with number two, the priority of the practice of justice. The priority of the practice of justice. Amen. That is in verses 11 and 12. Then we will conclude in verses 13 and 14 with number three, the price of the malpractice of justice. It costs you something when you don't practice justice. It costs you something when you don't live up to what God have called you to do. Amen? So let me read in this 21st chapter, verses um, 8, 9, and 10. Open your Bibles. This is the day that the Lord has made. Amen. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Amen. This is the word of God for the people of God. Amen. For such a time as this, God got a word for you. Amen. And so in verses 8, 9, and 10, in the 21st chapter of Jeremiah, whose name means that Yahweh uplifts or hurl or throws. Amen. And so, in that 21st chapter, verses 8, 9, and 10, we pray that you got it. It says, And unto this people thou shalt say, Thus saith the Lord, Behold, I set before you the way of life and the way of death. Verse 9 says, And he that abideth in this city shall die by the sword and by the famine and by the pestilence. But he that goeth out and falleth to the Chaldeans, which is another word for the Babylonians, that besiege you, he shall live, and his life shall be unto him for a prey. Verse 10, For I have set my face against this city for evil and not of good, saith the Lord, it shall be given into the hand of the king of Babylon, and he shall burn it with fire. The first thing I want to share with you here today about practicing justice, the paradox of the malpractice of justice. The paradox of the malpractice of justice. Amen. Because the people of Judah had practiced evil, they were given only two bleak options submit to the ba babylonian domination or fight unsuccessfully if you submit you will live amen but if you fight and try to stay behind these walls you're gonna die the prophet frames their dire condition as a result of their lack of concern for the lowly their lack of concern for doing justice. Neither of their options is desirable. Amen. God gave them two options, but to them, uh, they're not desirable op options. Because in if you read verses 1 down through verse 7, God called 
um, God called Jeremiah, and he, he told um, uh, he told uh, Pasha and he told Zephaniah priest, go get uh, uh, Jeremiah and tell Jeremiah to call on God to give us an answer in, in verses one, two on down. And um, he began to say, um, God did miracles, wonders work in time past. Go call on him and see if he'll do it again. But God doesn't give them a message that they want to hear. God says, amen, this is a difficult and challenging message for the people of God. God did speak through Jeremiah, but it wasn't what uh, King Zedekiah wanted to hear. God spoke through Jeremiah during these alarming and turbulent times. Jeremiah had attempted to persuade uh, the people of God to repentance and to faithfulness to the Lord, and he laid before them the consequences of their rebellion against God. Now, unfortunately, after so many years, the people chose to listen to false prophets who spoke comfort and peace to them in the midst of their unfaithfulness. To them, Jeremiah was giving them a hard word. They were saying to Jeremiah, hey, listen, uh, we don't want to hear that type of stuff. Amen. Just preach us happy in the midst of our sin. Uh, just tell us some good news. Uh, and so they considered Jeremiah a nuisance because they rejected the word of the Lord from the mouth of Jeremiah. Let me say this, something about prophets and pastors and teachers and preachers, amen. We're not here to give you what you want to hear. If we truly call by God, we got to say, thus saith the Lord. Every message we give you is not a shouting message. Some messages are the messages that get all right with God. Some messages, amen, if we listen to them and receive them, they are for our best interests. We may not want to hear it. And that's why Paul told Timothy, you got to preach in season and out of season. When people want to hear it or when they don't want to hear it, you got to give them the word of the Lord. That's why Paul said in Galatians 1 and 1, I am an apostle not of men, neither by men, but by Jesus Christ and God the Father, which raised him from the dead. Paul recognized that... Um, God, man did not call him. He's not apostle of man, neither by man. Man can come and lay their hands on you and uh, install you and so on and so forth, but only God can truly place you into the office. And when God places you into the office, you got to preach the word of God, whether the people of God want to receive it or not. We got to tell them, thus saith the Lord. And these are the people that God is using today, not just people just saying what the crowd want to hear, not just preaching to the choir. We got to tell people, thus saith the Lord. God is calling men and women to stand up and declare the infallible, inerrant word of God. It's the same yesterday. It's the same today. And the word that God had to King Zedekiah and to the people of God, uh, uh, you know, you, call, you want me to fight with you or for you. But God tells uh, Jeremiah to tell King Zedekiah, tell him, thus saith the Lord, I'm going to fight against you. He said, you have two options. You have two choices. This time, he would not, he's going to fight, amen, he's going to fight against you. And how many of you know that God will fight for the oppressed? When we oppress the poor, when we oppress the marginalized, when we oppress the immigrant, God will come and fight for them and fight against us. When I say us, I'm talking about we who do not practice justice. It's very important for the people of God, not just call on God when we get in trouble, but when the trouble come, we got to take time and to take a evaluation, a self-evaluation to see if we're standing on God's side or are we standing on the enemy's side. Hallelujah. This is not an easy message tonight because oftentimes we are praying uh, for release and, re and relief. And God is saying, I need, I want you to come to repentance. I want you to come back to me. Come back to me with your whole heart and not just with this uh, pseudo worship. Hallelujah. And so in verses 8, 9, and 10, God talks about, amen, the paradox of the malpractice of justice. Amen. He, uh, 
they had looked for God to come in verses uh, uh, 1 on down to verse 7. Uh, they wanted uh, Jeremiah to call on God and to give uh, them a word and see if God will come and fight for them. But the paradox is God is going to fight against his people. He's going to fight for the, uh, uh, for the poor and for the oppressed. Amen. If we're on the wrong side, he's going to fight against us. Hallelujah. Amen. So in verse 8, he, he turns to address to the people of the city. God had already been patient with his people for centuries, and, uh, but they started worshiping other gods and disregarded God's law. And now the time of judgment has finally come, yet even now, God is still a gracious God. In verse 9, he talks about the choices he gives them. He says, amen. Uh, uh, in verse 8, I set before you the way of life and death. And here's the way of life and death, he says in verse 9. He that abideth in this city shall die by the sword. If you abide in the city, you're going to die by the sword and by the famine and by the pestilence. But then it says that he that goeth out and falleth to the Chaldeans that besiege you because King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon had already besieged uh, Jerusalem. He had already besieged them. And what King Hezekiah had done, he had uh, 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 built an underground uh, water aqueduct. Amen. So water would come in. They thought they were safe. But God says you're not even safe there. Amen. And he said, if you go out and fall it upon the Chaldean, ye shall live and his life shall be unto him for a prey. Now, both of these choices um, are very difficult choices. One is to die and try to think that God's going to protect you inside the walls. And the other one is to go out and plead for mercy and fall into the hands of the Chaldeans. Amen. But it all boils down to, are you going to obey God to live, or are you going to obey God, disobey God and die? Sometimes the choices are difficult, but you got to follow the word of God. Amen. Sometimes the choices are difficult, but you got to follow the word of the Lord. Amen. And so he tells them in verse 9, he describes the way of life and the way of death for the inhabitants of Jerusalem. Those who chose to remain in the city and hide behind its wall during the Babylonian siege will face death. Jeremiah often refers to sword, famine, and pestilence to summarize the various ways in which God would judge his people for their unfaithfulness to him and to the covenant. And so he speaks of the sword, famine, and pestilence to, to summarize the various ways that God judges his people for unfaithfulness to the covenant. Amen. All three of these, the sword, famine, and pestilence, they all bring death, but from different sources. The sword refers to war. Famine refers to the lack of food, to the lack, uh, uh, due to the lack of rain. And pestilence is diseases or plagues. All three are among the covenant curses that God had promised to bring upon his people in Leviticus, the 26th chapter, and Deuteronomy, the 28th chapter. Amen. If they uh, uh, did not remain loyal to him, God said, I'll get you by the sword, I'll get you by famine, or I'll get you by pestilence. Amen. I'll get you by the sword through the battle. Amen. I'll get you by uh, uh, famine uh, through the lack of rain or I'll get you by pestilence, by disease. Amen? And so God is telling them, uh, the choices are difficult, but you have a choice to make. You can submit and surrender and live, or you can be disobedient and wayward and die. God has oftentimes told us, I set before you this day life and death. Amen? And the choice is yours. Have I got a witness here today? And so, God's ways are sometimes quite different from what we would think. We would think that uh, Babylon is besieging them and we call on God and he'll just come and get us out of trouble. That's where a lot of our theology is. Uh, I'm in trouble, God, I call on you, I'll get you out. But 
we haven't listened to what got us into trouble. We won't repent, even though people have told you over and over again, if you don't stop that, you don't get in trouble. But when we do get in trouble, we just want God to come get us out, but we still haven't learned our lesson. And so, my brothers and sisters, it behooves me to tell you today, amen, listen to the word of God and follow the word of God because it will keep you on the straight and narrow. God's ways are not our ways, and our ways are not his ways, amen. And there is a way that seemeth right unto man, but the end thereof is destruction. Choose life, amen. The choice is yours. Submit and surrender. Give yourself over to the Babylon. You shall live. But if you want to stay behind these walls and be disobedient and be wayward, you're going to die. Hallelujah. Amen. God has given us a choice to make. Amen. Praise the Lord. He goes on to verse 10 and says, I've set my face against this city for evil. God has said, I set my face against this city. The city, what? Jerusalem. I set my face against this city because they are pressing the poor. They're not being fair. Uh, they are um, uh, 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 raising the prices so high where uh, the poor cannot afford the things that they need. Amen. The, amen. They're living off the back of the poor and oppressing them. Amen. So God said, I've set my face against the city. Listen, let me tell you, it wasn't so much that the Babylonians were so powerful because they were the most powerful army at the time. Uh, but if the people of God were just trusting God and be obedient to the covenant of God, it was nothing that the Babylonians could not do because God was their God. But when the people of God started to worship in idol gods and start oppressing the poor and uh, being lawless and being uh, immoral, then God says in his word of verse 10, I have set my face against this city. Why? For evil and not for good saith the Lord. Listen, it's one thing for the Babylonians to come against you, but it's another thing for God to be working with the Babylonians to come against you. Hallelujah. Amen. When God is working for you, that means that you are being obedient to him and you're following his word and you're being obedient to the covenant. But God is now using the Babylonians as a rod, as a chastening rod against his people. Amen. And he says, it shall be given, verse 10, uh, it shall be given into the hand of the king of Babylon, and he shall burn it with fire. God is saying, uh, 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 this city, Jerusalem, it shall be given into the hands of the Babylon, of the king of Babylon, and he's going to burn it with fire. It wasn't so much that the king of Babylon was going to overthrow the city, but it's God who set his face against the city and using the Babylonians, the king of Babylonian, to come and besiege and ultimately destroy the city. We know the historical record that the Babylon came and um, tore down the walls and they lied in waste and totally demolished the uh, temple, amen, because the people of God, amen, had not been obedient to God and practiced justice. Amen. The same God, amen, that lift you up and bless you. He have told you in the book of Deuteronomy, amen, not only all these blessings shall come upon you and overtake you if you do these things. You're going to be blessed in the city, blessed in the field. But then he said all these curses shall come upon you, amen, and overtake you if you don't, amen, follow my word, my commandment, my justice, my statutes. It's very important that we take heed to the word of God no matter how difficult and challenging it is for us, amen. The second thing Jeremiah talks about is the priority of the practice of justice. Amen. That's in verses 11 and 10. A -a Amen. Verses 11 and 12. The priority of the practice of justice. Notice what it says in verses 11 and 12. I pray that you got your Bible. Thank you all for that. Yeah, just getting online uh, that are joining us. We praise God for your presence. Thank you for all that you're doing, amen, uh, for the ministry and still serving God in a difficult and challenging time. And once again, we love all our mothers. We praise God for you, amen, and thank God for you, amen. And let me just give a, amen, a hallelujah shout out to uh, Reverend Booker, Sister Booker. We're praying for you, amen. And then uh, the Poly alumni for joining in with us, amen. They've been following us. And to the OD-wide alumni uh, on last week, uh, 
uh, Carlos Cardi, Carter joined in with us, and we thank God for her. We're praying for her, and she sent word that to keep her lifted up in prayer. To, so all of my prayer warriors out there, keep Carlos uh, Carter lifted up in prayer. Amen. Verse 11 and 12, let me get to this. Amen. And touching the house of the king of Judah, say to him, Hear ye the word of the Lord. Now God is speaking to the royal family. O house of David, thus saith the Lord, execute judgment or justice in the morning and deliver him that is spalled out of the hand of the oppressor, lest my fury go out like fire and burn none, uh, burn that none can quench it because of the evil of your doings. That's a hard word going to the leaders. That's a hard word that is going to um, the royal family. Amen. God talks about uh, 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 the responsibility of leaders. Amen. God commands, uh, command is for justice to be the priority that is taken up as the first order of business. The first order of business for the people of God and make sure that justice is takes priority in everything that we do. I don't care. We can have church all day long and worship and praise, but if we're not treating one another right, if we're, if we're looking down on the poor, if we got classes in our church, if we got all this stuff going on and oppressing people, because even in the body of Christ, we have some spiritual oppressors. Amen. We look down on people and we talk about people, but yet we call on God to bless us. Amen. The first order of business, my brothers and sisters, and especially to the people of God, because this is the word that's going to the people of God in a very turbulent and trying time. They was besieged by Nebuchadnezzar and they was looking for a word. And the word that God gave them wasn't a good word. Not a good word to the leaders and not a good word to the people because not only... Well, the leaders are, are, are responsible for this, but the people that know better, that follow corrupt leaders, are responsible as well. You got to know the word of God for yourself. Amen. Uh, the, the prophet, if you notice all the prophets in the Old Testament, they're not preaching. They weren't preaching like the preachers and the prophets of contemporary. Amen. They won't talk about everybody getting a Cadillac and everybody going to get blessed. Amen. They were giving them the unadulterated word of God. It's infallible. It's inerrant. It, it, it will not change. Though man change, though time changes and culture changes. But what should take precedence and priority, the first order of business, is make sure that justice is being carried out. Hallelujah. Make sure that the people of God understand this, the way to be blessed, the way to be covered, the way to get God's favor is make sure we treat one another right and that we keep our end of the covenant because God is not slack concerning his promises. Whatever he's promised, he's able to fulfill. We have to hold up the end of our bargain. And when we do that, no enemy, no weapon formed against us shall prosper. Hallelujah. Amen. We've got to go looking for a blessing. We don't have to manufacture a blessing. We don't have to look for a pseudo blessing. Amen. Only God can bless us and keep us and cover us the way we need to be covered. Amen. Praise the Lord. So God command for justice to be the first priority that is taken up. Amen as the first order of business. It cannot be secondary or ignored. Listen, God cares about the live, uh, the, uh, the lived experiences of people who are trapped by hands that steal from them, that devalue them and benefit, benefit from their powerlessness. Amen. Since these are God's priorities, they should also be the priority of God's people and especially for God's leaders. Amen. We should look out for those that are, are powerless, to, for those that are marginalized. We should look out for those who cannot help themselves. Amen. They need somebody that got the spiritual boldness. Amen. To stand up and say, hey, Thus saith the Lord, amen. You don't mistreat your brothers and sisters, amen. God needs some people that is not self-centered 
and only con concerned about what they get out of it. Amen. We should look out for one another. Amen. And so this is why Jeremiah directs his prophecy to the house of David, especially to the leaders. The work of leaders demands a commitment to equity. Equity is not the same as equality. The passage does not only express that leaders should treat everyone the same, which is equality, it compels them to right the wrong and do more for those who have been mistreated. That is equity. Amen. Making this type of justice a priority aligns with God's values and prevents God's wrath from breaking out on behalf of the marginalized. Amen. I pray that y'all get that. Amen. From verses 11 and 12. Amen. God provides one last opportunity for the people to escape with their lives. Amen. Verse 8 and 10. Now he turns back to address the defeated king. Zedekiah and all the ones come after him. Amen. Amen. And so God tells them his message for the king began with a command to judge the most common to judge. Uh, amen. The word in the Hebrew, amen, most common used in the Old Testament speaks of justice, practice justice. Amen. Although this justice is to be dispensed literally in the morning, the New, Test the New Living Translation each morning better communicates the intended meaning that justice is to be a continual and top priority for the king. Justice should be a justice that starts in the morning. It should be continual and a top priority for the king and for the leaders of God. Amen. It is one of the primary responsibilities of the king of Israel to perform justice and righteousness throughout the land by maintaining God's law and promoting economic and social welfare of the entire population. Amen. Sadly, it becomes clear from the next two chapters of Jeremiah that the defeated king had failed miserably in their responsibility toward the lower class. How many you know in the, in the kingdom of God there are no classes? There are no upper class, no uh, no middle class, no uh, middle, middle class, no middle, lower class, and no lower class. Amen. Amen. We all are saints. We're all the children of God. Amen. Uh, and we've all been uh, uh, saved by the blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. So this is the primary responsibility of kings in Israel is to perform justice. Hallelujah. So, amen. First of all, we talked about the, the priority of the paradox of the malpractice of justice. The second that we talked about the priority of the practice of justice in verses 11 and 12. Well, thirdly, in verses 13 and 14, we're going to deal with the practice of the price, rather, the price of the malpractice of justice. In other words, there's a penalty and price to pay for the malpractice of justice. When you pervert justice, when you mistreat people and say it's okay to do that, and when you go along with uh, mistreating and uh, misusing and abusing those who can't defend themselves, those that are powerless, uh, when you exercise these things, when you are leaders and you do these things, amen, there's a price to pay. And how you know that uh, when God, hey, that's why I said, vengeance is mine, said the Lord, and I will repay. Amen. Verses 13 and 14, amen, says, Behold, I am against thee, O inhabitant of the valley, and rock of the plain, saith the Lord, which say, who shall come down against us? That's an arrogant, uh, proud spirit that think nothing can happen to you because you save, you're in church and think you got so much and can't nobody do nothing to you. Or who shall enter in to our habitation. Who can break through these walls? We got, it, we got it all together right here. We covered. Verse 14 says, But I will punish you according to the fruit of your doing, saith the Lord, and I will kindle a fire in the forest thereof, and it shall devour all things round 
about. Hallelujah. Amen. That's the price of the malpractice of justice. Amen. There are choices, but choices have consequences. And when you willfully uh, practice injustice, when you willfully mistreat uh, the oppressed and the marginalized and those who cannot defend themselves, amen, there is a penalty and price to pay. You may get away with it on this side. You may think that you're covered. You may think that you're protected and sheltered uh, from that. But when God can move, even if, um, even if man doesn't judge you, God got a way of moving. Amen. We should never become desensitized to the harshness of the language of these verses. Because these are some hard verses to, to deal with. Uh, most of the children of God and the people of God, we want to read stuff that's going to make us feel good. Uh, we want to read things that uh, can make us shout, but there's come a time that the word of God go forward when it calls you to repent, it calls you to cry, it calls you to mourn, it calls you to pray, it calls you to get right with God, and God begin to flush out all that stuff in us because it's easy to become desensitized to all the corrupt things that are going on, the languages and the culture that we're living in right now. It's very easy for the people of God to become desensitized to these things. Uh, the prophet raised the tone and allows for the hearer to hear God testifying against and declaring war on people that God no longer call, that no longer calls by God's name uh, or their name. Notice what he says. He don't call them my people. He says they are referred to only as inhabitant of the valley. God declares that he will allocate their punishment by their action. The Bible says in uh, Galatians 6 and 7, be not deceived, God is not mocked. Whatever man soweth, he shall also reap. Unfortunately for them, their actions are highly flammable and their punishments is a kindled fire. These verses, uh, verses 13 and 14, highlight the significance of one's action, especially when he or she thinks that they can get away with wrongdoing. Listen, my brother and sister, sometimes we think we're getting away with um, practicing uh, uh, injustice. Um, uh, you know, I, I just want to say that we don't get away with it. Amen. God sees, God hears, God knows. Amen. For those who uh, have been um, who dealing with injustice right now, amen, God sees what's going on. Amen. And God will fight for you. Amen. And, and uh, sometimes you're up wake, uh, all night long uh, and concerned and worried about what men and people are doing to you. But I'm going to tell you, when God fight for you, amen, man cannot stand. Amen. They can't fight against what they can't see. God got away. Amen. And God is a champion of the oppressed. God will fight for those who cannot fight for themselves. Hallelujah. Amen. And so we don't have to st stay up worried about it all night long. Amen. Um, God got a way of turning that thing around. He got a way of working all things together for the good of them that love the Lord and of them who are called according to his purpose. Amen. Be not weary in well-doing. We shall reap if we faint not. Amen. And so God says there is a penalty, a price to pay for practicing Amen. Uh, uh, justice. Amen. The price of the the price of the malpractice of justice. And when we practice injustice, there is a penalty and a price to pay. Amen. I know somebody received that today. Amen. Listen, this passage serves should serve as an impetus to make sure that one's actions are geared to seeking and pursuing justice. Because if they are not you may find yourself fighting against God. Amen. And that's a battle none of us can win when you fight against God. Amen. That's a battle none of us can win. Amen. Sometime, and, and, and Saul had to learn that. Amen. The Lord uh, showed, uh, appeared to Saul on the road to Damascus and said, Saul, Saul, why persecuted thou me? Amen. Saul said, who are thou, Lord, that I persecute? I'm Jesus. Don't you know it's hard to kick against the prick. Amen. When you kick against the prick, you're only hurting yourself and you cannot win a battle when you fight against God. Hallelujah. Amen. So as we close in these 13 and 14 verse, God continues to describe the judgment he will bring against the king of Judah and on the whole city. In the previous verse, God, um, 
God had given them a strong warning, encouraged them to change their ways to avoid judgment. Here in verse 13 and 14, it becomes clear that the verdict is already in. They had failed and God's judgment is certain. Listen, before God judge, he always warns us. He's patient God. He's a long-suffering God. Now, with an end man should perish, but all men may come to know him. Hallelujah. God is a patient God. Amen. I see some people that are chiming in right now. God bless you. Thank you. Amen. Uh, amen. I, I can't read it. Amen. But uh, thank you all for all your comments. Amen. God has often intervened as a divine warrior on behalf of his people, as he did in the book of Exodus. He fought, he fought for his people. Amen. Amen. But in but this time in verse uh, 14, amen, amen, uh, uh, he's going to fight against his people. Amen. God here addresses the inhabitants of the valley and the rock of plain, both unusual descriptions he used. These are references to Jerusalem, which is surrounded by, on three sides by valleys and was relatively strong rock-like fortress. The kings are still in view here, but now the broader population of the city is addressed as well. Amen. Uh, the people are, were quite confident that they were safe and secure. Amen. They thought they was in Jerusalem. They thought they were safe. They thought they were secure, but Nebuchadnezzar led the most powerful army in the world at that time. The small and powerless nation of Judah had little chance against them from a human point of view. Although the people are described as wicked, they were still pious and religious. And so many of them believed that God would protect them and that he would never allow his temple, his city, and the king to be taken. And this is the kind of faith in God uh, but it is a faith that assumes that righteous living does not really matter. It means that uh, I mean, God will come protect you no matter how wicked or sinful we are. Uh, uh, God, you my God, amen. Grace of God, the grace of God is not a license to a sinful, messy life. Hallelujah. The grace of God is not a license to keep on sinning. Amen. We can't think that we're safe and secure because I'm a child of God. And, and so uh, Zedekiah and the people of God thought, amen, they, they're in this very, uh, walled and uh, 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 walled city that nothing can penetrate them. But they, uh, they had it uh, sorely wrong. Now, in response to their both boastfulness, claim that no one can enter the city, amen, because uh, they said that uh, in verse 13, who shall come against down against us. Who shall enter into our habitation? And that's a boastful claim. God says that he would do so. <laughs> Listen, you think your city is so, so secure, God can enter in. God said that he would do so himself to punish the fruit of their doing. But notice what he said in verse 14. But I will punish you according to the fruit of your doing, saith the Lord. Amen. This refer to the many violation of God's law, but it is referred mainly to uh, the one issue described at the beginning of God's message in verse 12, the failure of the king and the people to deal justly with the needy in the land. They did not execute justice or judgment. God's judgment would turn, uh, would take the uh, the form of fire and fire will devour and consume everyone around them, the whole city will be destroyed. Israel thought that they were in, could not be penetrated, thought that they were secure and safe in their walled city. Amos put it like this in Amos 6 and 1, War unto them that are at ease in Zion, who trust in the mountains of Samaria, which are named chief of the nation, to whom the home of Israel came. War unto them that are easy in Zion, think that everything is okay and they're comfortable and that nothing could uh, come against them. Amen. They trusted in the mountains around Samaria, uh, which are named the chief of the nations. Amen. Uh, and they're trusting in all those things, but they failed to recognize that only God can keep us safe. Only God uh, can protect us. 
And so I challenge you today, my brothers and sisters, to practice ju justice, amen, with your fellow brothers and your sisters, amen, to practice justice with your family, with your loved one, amen. Don't mistreat nobody, uh, That and we that are leaders and pastors, amen. Um, we can't just look to give people the word they want. We got to be in tune with the Lord for word that is relevant, that is in season for what we're going through right now. God is still yet speaking. Um, the word may be harsh as Jeremiah is giving right now, but really at the heart of this message, God loves his people. Now we quote Jeremiah 29 and 11, for I know the thoughts I uh, think towards you. I know the plans I have for your thoughts of good and not evil to bring you to the ex expected end. But uh, before that, he talks about, amen, after 70 years or uh, accomplish. In other words, they what Jeremiah's talking about here in the 21st chapter, amen, they're going to go into captivity and they're going to go for 70 years, not because Babylon is so strong and so great of a nation, but because uh, the people of God, beginning with the northern kingdom and now the southern kingdom, amen, have turned their backs, turned their hearts away from God and worshiping idol gods and also oppressing the poor. And God says, I'm going to fight against you. Don't think that you're safe in your uh, walled uh, surroundings. Don't think you're only safe in your um, walled off community. Don't think that you just because you got gates around your community, you are safe. Amen. When God come against a, a nation, God come against a people, God fights uh, against you. It's for a reason because we're not living up to our end of the covenant. And God will keep his word. Amen. In the midst of all this, there is a word of hope. Amen. God give them a choice. Amen. If you go out and fall among the people, you shall live. But if you just stay behind these walls and rebel, you're not rebelling against Nebuchadnezzar and Babylon. You're rebelling against my word because I've given you an option. It, 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 it's, it's an option that you don't like. And sometimes uh, we have options, but we don't like them. And so we don't want to take them. Amen. We want to be independent. Amen. And, uh, but there come a time we all got to trust God that he knows what's best. And sometimes it hurts, but it's for our best. Amen. And that's what the mother does to us when we was growing up and father does to us. Amen. We didn't like the choice. We didn't like the options, but they was directing us and guiding us in the right way, the more fruitful way that bring peace, that will bring, um, bring peace in the home. Amen. And guide us in the right way. And so my brothers and sisters that close here today, let us remember the most important uh, thing, amen, the first order of business in our uh, dealing, in our life, amen. As the text says, uh, we should uh, execute judgment in the morning. It should be the first thing and it should be a continual thing, amen. The first thing we should do, the first priority of business and not uh, just going here and there and what we can do for the Lord, but make sure that in our going and in our doing, in our deeds and our walk, that we're treating one another right, then that's when the real blessings will flow. That's when the real glory of God be revealed. We will be that light. We'll be that salt. And when we treat one another right, Jesus said, by this, all men will know that you are my disciples and you have love one for another. You cannot love your brother and mistreat your brother and oppress your brother. Hallelujah. Amen. Thank you all for joining us tonight. Amen. I pray that you've been blessed by this message. And I said earlier that uh, this lesson, this Sunday school lesson coming up for Sunday, is a difficult message. It's a challenging message, but it's a message that is relevant for the turbulent and trying time that we're de dealing with. Jeremiah, this particular time I said, we're dealing with some uh, turbulent crises of lawless, lawlessness and injustice and immorality and uh, a whole lot of things that were going on, social and uh, injustice, amen. We're living in that time right now. But the people of God, God got a word for you. Keep your heart pure before the Lord, amen. Execute judgment and justice. May that be the priority, amen, uh, that we practice every day. And God will truly bless us, amen. Thank you all for joining us once, once again. I love you with the love of the Lord. Thank you for your continued support for the ministry. Thank you for what you're doing, CMBC family. Thank you for your prayers 
and to our mothers, I love you with the love of the Lord. I wish for nothing uh, more on this Mother's Day. I could embrace my mothers of the church and love on them and let them know how much they mean to me and how much they mean to the kingdom of God and for the household of faith. Amen. Your value and your worth. Amen. Thank God for you. We pray for your health. We pray for your strength. We pray that God cover your family, that God cover your loved one. Amen. And once again, be safe, be uh, uh, sheltered in place. Amen. Be strong and be faithful. Amen. Continue to minister. Continue to call somebody up and, and tell them that you love them with the love of the Lord. Amen. Ask them if they need anything. Amen. And we will make sure their needs are met. And then thirdly, whisper a brief word of prayer for them. Amen. We love you all. God bless you all. Meet us again on Sunday at 10 a.m. Amen. We will be streaming live. Amen. Meet us. Amen. Pray for us. We love you all with the love of the Lord. Amen. And remember, amen, the Lord in all that you do. Amen. Let us close with a word of prayer. Amen. Sister Carlos Holly, we will continue to pray for you. Amen. Uh, God bless you. Amen. Practice justice is, is our lesson. Amen. Thank you all for joining us. Amen. Corey uh, Arrington, thank you. God bless you. Joe McGinty in Houston, Texas. Amen. And all of you, thank you for joining us. Amen. In our lesson today. Let us close with a word of prayer. Eternal God, our God, faithful, merciful, loving, and just God. How we thank you, God, for who you are, God. Thank you once again for your many blessings upon us. Lord, I thank you right now for blessing our mothers on this Mother's Day, those that are yet still here with us. And Lord, even I praise you for the many mothers and aunts and grandmothers, God, who have gone on to glory. God, I pause right now and thank you because we are who we are and where we are because your hand was upon them and their hand, their love, their faith, God, they transmitted, they imputed upon us. So God, we thank you and we celebrate them even now. We will never stop celebrating them for their legacy and their life, God, is still touching us and we bless you and we thank you for them. Now, Lord, I pray, God, that you'll cover and bless all those in my listening audience. Many have asked for prayer. We pray that you move right now, meet them right there in their homes, right where they are. Thank you right now, God, for healing Carlos, uh, Carter. God, we thank you right now for blessing the Mays family. Thank you right now for blessing the Barton family, the Smith family. I pray for my brothers and sisters here in Fort Worth. I pray for my brothers and sisters and family there in Navasota, Texas, Houston. Thank you for them. My loved ones in Colorado and England, God, and uh, Dallas, God, we praise you for all of them that are listening, God, that, uh, that shared this word today. Now, Lord, this is your word, the prophetic word from uh, Jeremiah, the prophet, the priest. Thank you for this word, God, and it's a difficult word, but it's a challenging word, challenging your people, God, to repent and come back to you, God, and the choice you have given us is life and death. Thank you right now, for God, we know it's not your will that any man should perish, but all men may come to know you. So, God, we thank you, and we praise you for your word. Now, Lord, continue to bless us and lead us in the right way. We'll be forever to give your name the glory and all of the praise. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless your family. We love you. Have a blessed and wonderful night. Hug everybody, uh, my family. Hug everybody for me, and tell them, hey, Pastor McGinty, Robert Jr., love you all with the love of the Lord. God bless you. Have a blessed night.